There was an incident that happened in the Edo period of Japan where a samurai became obsessed with a popular kabuki actor, who was also a male prostitute. This relationship was hard on the samurai's wallet because he had to pay every time he wanted to spend the night with his lover. He even bought lavish gifts. Eventually, he sold all of his belongings to fund the relationship and had nothing left. Desperate, he stole the sword of another samurai and sold it. Unfortunately, the theft was reported and they caught the samurai. Both he and his prostitute were executed. This incident is a great example of how people went crazy over kabuki sex workers and a dire warning to Twitch viewers. Kabuki theater started in 1603 and is still popular in Japan today among total snobs. What you may not know about is its history of prostitution. Kabuki and paid sex went together like balls and milk tea. Kabuki actors were the celebrities of their time, and people squandered their life savings to share a bed with them. The art form was created by women at the very beginning of the Edo period. Theater at the time catered to the upper class and left commoners with an aching need. Luckily, Kabuki filled that hole. Women got together into troops and started performing in front of ordinary townspeople. It became a hit, and kabuki theaters spread across Japan's entertainment districts faster than syphilis. Performances were done mostly by all women groups who played both men and women roles, and they made sure to thrust as much lewd and sexually suggestive content into their performances as this channel does. Sex sells, especially when many of the women were prostitutes themselves, adult actresses who could act. The kabuki business always had issues with the law. These actresses became super famous. But with great fame comes great simpering fans. Fans obsessed over their goddesses and happily engaged in violent arguments with other fans. It got so bad that in 1629, the law stepped in and just banned female performers. Sucks for them, but it allowed men to shine bright like a diamond. And thank the gods, I was beginning to worry that there was a place in Edo society not entirely dominated by men. The law failed. Simps are relentless. Instead of dampening their kimonos over female actors, they dampened them over male actors who played female roles, especially young actors. Male youths who were usually around 15 to 18 years old had more feminine features, so they were better for female roles. I talk about these male youths in another video, but the important thing is that they had this forelock of hair in front of their heads, which differentiated them from adult men who didn't have the forelock. People found these forelocks super sexy, like a man with rock-hard abs or a woman with two large overflowing bank accounts. Lawmakers saw that the same problem was happening with these youth actors who played female roles and were like, oh my Buddha, these some bitches horny. And in 1642, they banned all female roles, hoping it would end the insanity. Did it work? Does a princess shit in the woods? Of course not. The thirst was strong with these ones. Kabuki theater became dominated by youth actors playing only male roles. They still made plays with sex themes, but now it was male-male sex themes. And that got out of control. And so the ban hammer fell again on youth actors, since it was mostly the youth actors that people soaked their pants over. Now only adult men could be actors. The government rejoiced at their success, but it was a premature celebration. In 1644, either because of public outrage or because there was an epidemic of balls turning blue and exploding in Japan, historians are still debating this, the government ended the ban on female roles, meaning adult men could play female roles again. In 1652, they loosened the condom further and allowed youth actors to return to the stage on one condition. That forelock that all youths had, that sultry symbol of sex, had to go. Male youth actors were forced to shave them off to limit their beauty. The forelock was the hairstyle of youths. Shaving it made them adult men. I guess the reasoning was that no one would be attracted to men, which is generally true. Actors regularly presented the tops of their heads to inspectors who made sure the hair up there stayed less than half an inch long. This worked for a little while. Actors did look uglier without their foxy forelocks, but sex finds a way. After shaving their forelocks, kabuki actors wore these purple scarves on the top of their heads. Fans started finding these scarves sexy, just like the forelocks they replaced, and the simping resumed in earnest. The bans not only backfired, they may have even made things worse for the government by increasing male prostitution. How? Remember that many of these youth actors were prostitutes, called kagema. 
Their forelocks lured in customers like an anglerfish lures in BuzzFeed article writers. Adult men weren't popular in the naughty entertainment business. It was mostly youths who were not yet considered adults. However, the forelock ban blurred the line between youth and adulthood. Actors did look older without their forelock, but they still played the more beautiful younger roles and female roles. It changed the public's sexual tastes. People started seeing adult men as younger and hotter. This was good news for male prostitution. Kagema, over 20 years old, used to have a hard time attracting customers. They just looked older and uglier. Older Kagema often saw their client base shift from mostly men to mostly women because men were not attracted to other men. The new beauty standards embraced older entertainers and they saw their most lucrative years extend into their 30s. Now, unlike me, most people are not born with natural artistic talent. Likewise, most people were not born kabuki actors. Usually, they started as kagema in these brothels called tea houses. Tea houses that specialized in serving up kagema were called kagema jaya or kagema tea house. I have a video about these too if you want to check it out. Tea houses were everywhere, especially near kabuki theaters, and they were very popular, especially among samurai and Buddhist monks. A common saying went, the only thing that all Buddhist sects agree on is the fun to be had at male tea houses. They weren't talking about tea. Tea houses had an intimate relationship with kabuki theaters. They supplied kagema to theater patrons and acted as love hotels for kabuki actors and their paying fans. All this male prostitution was technically illegal, by the way. The government never licensed these places. Just to keep up appearances, kabuki theaters didn't flaunt the fact that you could sleep with their actors. And tea houses had signs saying they sold kabuki costumes or trained kabuki apprentices. It was better than having a giant penis on the window. The authorities knew what was really going on, of course, everyone did, but they ignored it, the way a man would ignore his girlfriend's cheating because it'd be too much trouble to confront her, and at the end of the day, he just wants to go home to his wife and kids. At tea houses, some kagema were trained in kabuki. Life at the tea house was generally miserable. The lucky ones got to apprentice at kabuki theaters. Luckier ones became real kabuki actors after their contracts ended. And even luckier ones had their contracts bought out by a sponsor so they could pursue an acting slash sex work career. That's also my goal, by the way, so please remember to sponsor me so I can finally escape this hell of creating videos for random strangers on the internet while the CEO of YouTube, Susan Wojcicki, is behind me in a leather suit cracking her whip. Please help. For those tea house kagema who finally became real licensed kabuki actors, life was better. They usually still did sex work. Kabuki actors were assumed to be kagema. They were huge celebrities. Think of a hot celebrity, then think of sharing the bed with them. You can see how fans back then jumped at the opportunity up and down again and again. Youth actors captured the hearts of millions along with their other body parts. There were fan clubs devoted to their favorite actors, and members would gather and attend plays together. It was cute. Then they paid to sleep with the actors, which was less cute. Youth actors made way more money than their older peers. Many enjoyed the fame. Young actors walking the town received enough thirsty stares and declarations of love to adequately fill the empty hole in their hearts that their absent parents created. Popular actors bedded any man or woman they wanted. It was raining bitches and they didn't have an umbrella. They spent their days drowning in love letters. Nothing made an actor happier than that wonderful feeling of reading a heartfelt love letter and throwing it in the trash. People would spend their life savings buying gifts for actors and buying time with them. A man's relationship with a kagema was seen as more pure and affectionate than his relationship with his wife, or even his relationship with a youth who's not a prostitute. Sex with a kagema was supposed to be better than sex with your other loved ones, like your wife or a youth. Those people got too emotional, ruining the sex. Kagema, however, were more professional and focused on giving you pleasure. Male sex workers were not as common as female ones, but they often charged more than their female peers. Like how we have movie critics today, there were kabuki theater critics, and they were just as unbearable. Critics wrote reviews not only of an actor's performance on stage, but also his performance in the bedchamber. The top kabuki actors lived pretty great lives. If you wanted their intimate services, you had to reserve days in advance. Leaders of kabuki troops, who might have been too old themselves, frequently offered the bodies of the younger actors under them for prostitution. There were downsides to the life of a kabuki actor. Sometimes they had fans who took it too far. The plural of love is harassment. Some fans became obsessed and stalked their idols, even sneaking into their dressing rooms during shows. 
fans fought in the streets over their idols. The violence got bad enough that the city of Edel had to issue a law saying stop fighting over youths, you maniacs. There were laws to limit how much monetary sexy time was going on, especially for the samurai class. It was undignified for samurai to attend kabuki plays, because those miserable places were supposed to be for commoners. Samurai were only supposed to enjoy no theater. But the pull of kabuki on their peepee -pee was too strong. Kabuki plays were all about naughty stuff, all about fun. Samurai became one of the main consumers of kabuki plays and kagema flesh. The government wasn't exactly happy, but they didn't crack down on what was happening. Maybe they thought it was a good outlet for people's desires. Maybe they thought they couldn't stop it anyways. Or maybe the lawmakers were connoisseurs of the kabuki kink themselves. The government just passed laws to keep people from going too wild. They tried to limit the amount of sleeping around that went on in theaters. So Kagama often had to see customers outside of the theater, like at a tea house. In the capital city of Edo, actors had to live their lives inside the theater district. They couldn't take one step outside. Although that didn't stop rich actors from secretly buying extra houses outside of the district, becoming hoes in different area codes. Alright, for more sex talk, check out these videos. We have some new Patreon patrons, Ashley Cook, a most wonderful chef, Tina Nguyen, hey fellow Vietnamese person, maybe not, is anyone as cool as her, maybe not, and Eva, a classic anime. Alright, I love you and spread the knowledge.